Welcome everyone to the folks in the room. And I know there's still some folks trickling in on Zoom, but I think we're gonna get started. Um, so welcome everyone to the Berkman Klein Center's Institute for Rebooting Social Media at Harvard University. My name is Tony Gardner and I direct operations for our institutes. I wanna start by thanking our wonderful co-hosts for today's event, the Schwartz Reisman Institute for Internet and Society at the University of Toronto. And now allow me the pleasure of introducing our moderator and event organizer, Professor, Professor Lisa Austin. Lisa Austin is the Chair of Law and Technology and a professor in the University of Toronto's Faculty of Law. Austin is a faculty affiliate at the Schwartz Reisman Institute, where she also serves as an associate director, currently on leave, and a visiting scholar with the Institute for Rebooting Social Media. Her research focuses on legal theory as well as law and technology, and her extensive privacy work has been cited numerous times by Canadian courts, including the Supreme Court of Canada. In 2017, Austin received a President's Impact Award from the University of Toronto. Over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Tony, um, and uh, thank you. Welcome everyone here. Uh, whether you're here as an audience member, a panelist, one of our uh, moderators, um, whether you're in person or online, um, uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, and I wanted to also give a shout out to my co-organizer, um, Neda Fatai, who's an employee fellow here at RSM. Um, she couldn't be with us today, but I just want to say that she did a lot of work um, behind the scenes in helping to organize these panels, and it's wonderful. Um, I wanted to give a few introductory remarks before um, I introduce our first panel and the panelists on it. And I think that you know, we're at this interesting moment in time where we see we're currently internationally in the midst of quite a wide range of legal and regulatory interventions targeting digital platforms, including social media companies. Um, and you know, all invoking kind of different ideas of what we think might be going wrong in relation to these platforms and social media companies. Um, and we're also beginning to see that, that a new trend, which is to um, start to force these companies to provide external researchers with access to data. So prominent examples, many of you know, are the EU's Digital Services Act, which is now in effect. Um, here in the, US, in the US, there's the proposed Platform Accountability and Transparency Act. Um, I'm from Canada. I know we have Canadians in the audience today and, and uh, here in person and online. Canada's new proposed Online Harms Act, which hasn't been passed, um, also has provisions about researcher access to data held by social media companies. All of these models have different mechanisms, um, quite different in the, in the different models, to determine things like who gets to be considered a trusted researcher, what kind of research can be done, what sort of data is available, um, and how to protect important interests like privacy. And these proposals are coming in, in the context of sort of the, the status quo that we've had for um, ages, which is a situation that I like to label as corporate data altruism. So the platforms themselves are the ones who have the final say over the kind of when, why, how, and what of data access. Um, and not to, we can beat up a lot of, on, on, on platforms, but to, to also acknowledge that, you know, researcher access is not without its own problems. And we'll talk about some of the risks today too. Um, it's worth remembering that Alexander Kogan, the individual at ground zero of Cambridge Analytical Scandal, was a Cambridge researcher who violated Facebook's policies in relation to access to Facebook data. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, the, sort of stands in um, for some people as the privacy risks associated with um, uh, creating more uh, access. But the status quo of corporate data altruism is shifting, and you can think of it shifting in relation to a couple of different types of models. So we might pose against corporate data altruism, individual data altruism, where it's the individuals who should be the ones who decide, um, you know, who, what kinds of research projects and researchers to share data with, um, which is usually buttressed with ideas of data portability, um, and can be um, justified in ways that are found very familiar to us in sort of data law around individual agency, individual empowerment, control over data. Um, but these other acts that I just mentioned are more about mandated access, and that sounds a little bit strange some, to some people, um, mandating access to data held by private sector companies. How could we justify that? 
Um, and I think one of the interesting parallels for me as a lawyer is to think about uh, parallels to freedom of information laws. So we have freedom of information laws in the public sector in most liberal democracies in the world. Uh, we do this for a range of reasons, uh, including accountability and also the sense that information itself is a public resource. Um, and I think that you know what we're starting to see is kind of a move towards these sort of different rationales for mandated access uh, to platform data. And you can see this reflected in the different models. So I just want to say a couple of things about each of these three models. I talked about Canada, the EU, and, and the US, with again, only the EU actually has something in effect. So Canada has proposed a new um, online harms act. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with this, uh, the, the act imposes a, a duty on the regulated entities to act responsibly in relation to a number of different categories of harmful content. I'm not going to go through sort of the details of that, um, but just that, you know, there's very specific categories, there's like seven of them, uh, so a very specific set of harms. What the regulated entities have to do is come up with a digital safety plan. Um, and then the researcher access is connected to this in the following sort of way. So there's a provisions for people to become accredited persons. Um, and then what they can um, uh, have is access to the data that's listed as in the data inventories that support the digital safety plan. So you have a digital safety plan, you get data inventories that sort of support that. And then you've got some access to those inventories or the data listed in the inventories. So it's a very narrow kind of access and the research has to be for those purposes of the act, which are these like, you know, seven categories of, of harms. So it's a very, very narrow kind of idea. It's more like, well, okay, let's enable researchers to be sort of external auditors in a kind of um, a specific kind of way. Um, the EU Digital Service Act is much broader. So the research, there too also has to be linked to the purposes of the act, but the, the research that, that can enable is much broader because the act applies to a broader range of risks. Instead of you know, seeking to create sort of guardrails around a narrow set of harms, the EU Digital Services Act purpose is to ensure a safe, predictable, and trusted online environment. Um, and so the, the potential data access is not as limited as in Canada's model. Um, and there are detailed provisions regarding um, uh, what vetted researchers can get access to um, and the requirements to protect privacy, but also some interesting re requirements um, around uh, non-vetted researchers who can get access to types of public content. Um, and I know some people uh, in our, our panels are going to talk about some of that later today too. PADA, so the US model, which is not passed, but just proposed in the Senate, um, is broader still in the kinds of research it can enable because instead of having a data access kind of linked to this sort of accountability for harms and risks, where we add that on as a kind of accountability type framing, um, when I read PETA anyway as, a, as an outsider, um, it seems like it's primarily concerned about the conditions of independent research. Um, and so the potential research isn't tied to specific regulatory purposes or framings of harms. Um, and uh, I find that very interesting. There are constraints on certain kinds of data um, being caught up in this kind of broad framing, including things like private messaging, biometric data, geolocation data. Um, so the pattern model is much more about, it seems to me, that there's an important public value in being able to independently understand platforms. And so, you know, I think that as a, as a lawyer, I totally understand the accountability value. Um, it's a rule of law value. And there's a lot to be said for enabling sort of uh, accountability holding practices that aren't just about the regulators, but also about civil society. And that requires data. Um, but there's also a lot to be said in favor of a broader focus. Um, the need to ensure that our digitally mediated world is independently knowable and that the ability to know it is actively distributed. So when impediments to sort of research involve unequal access to epistemic resources and opportunities, when the inequality advantages some at the expense of others, then I think we're no longer thinking about just how to encourage research as a public good, um, but about the basic terms of epistemic justice. Um, and so 
you know, just to, before we move on to the first panel, I think potentially there's quite a lot at stake in these questions about access to data held by platforms. We can take a kind of narrow view, we can take a broad view, um, and I think the broad view opens into quite an interesting sort of set of questions um, that we might ask about some of these models. Um, and I think you know, Canada's is the worst of three, I think I listed seven. <laughs> so, so all the Canadians listening, uh, uh, we need to sort of intervene on that. Okay, so um, the, the first panel that we have, we're gonna talk about um, the, the opportunities and some of the risks involved in, in um, access to data. And I wanna introduce my panelists uh, first. Uh, so uh, next to me, we have uh, Swati Srivasa, who is uh, an associate professor of political science at Purdue University and a visiting scholar here at the Institute for Rebuilding so Social Media. So I've had the great pleasure of uh, having many amazing conversations with Swati over the last many months. Uh, her research interests concern private power and global governance, especially public-private relations between governments, corporations, and NGOs. Her latest research evaluates the political power and responsibility of big tech companies and tracks regulation in an international comparative context. Uh, next to her is Gabriel Nicholas. Gabe is a research fellow at the Center for Democracy and Technology and a non-resident fellow at the NYU School of Law Information Law Institute. His research focuses on AI governance, data sharing, and content moderation. Gabriel is a software engineer by train and has a master's in information management and systems from UC Berkeley School of Information. And next to Gabe is Jeffrey Hall. Jeff is a professor of communication studies at the University of Kansas and a visiting scholar at the Institute for Rebooting Social Media. Um, also had the benefit of many conversations with Jeff about social media research. Jeff studies how to elevate positive online experience through meaningful social interaction and relationships um, and has been an amazing resource to all of us here this year and a guide to what what does the social science evidence say and not say about the impacts of, of social media? Um, so I thought we'd start with a, 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 a set of questions um, to kind of invite my panelists to answer them in light of their own very different research um, experiences. So both Jeff and Swati um, research social media companies um, and Gabe is interested in how we you know, uh, enable researching and access um, uh, to the social media companies. And so I thought that what we'd start to talk about is to try to understand why is data access so important to research on the social and political effects of platforms like social media companies. Um, uh, and if you could sort of briefly tell us why provisions for access to data are important for research purposes generally, um, and whether you think that those purposes are broader than sort of a, a kind of accountability for harms framework that motivates some of this recent legislation, um, uh, or you know how does how does the social media research landscape to you look in relation to some of these rationales for for access? And uh, Jeff, because you know I've been talking about social harms with you for all year, I'm going to start um, okay. on your end. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Lisa, for being uh, for inviting me. It's great to be here. Uh, so, hello, everyone uh, in the audience and out there online. Um, I think I want to start with a couple of kind of observations to let you all know about the kind of state of social media research, and then I want to broaden that conversation slightly to why it's important for researchers and how researchers currently access from the social sciences access to uh, social media use, social media data. The first thing that I want to say is we are in the midst of yet another very intense time of debate. Uh, the release of Jonathan Haidt's book and a lot of the conversations around TikTok have really changed my own opinion about how fast Congress could act in terms of uh, regulating social media companies. Um, just a little while ago, I was actually very skeptical that the idea that Congress would ever get their act together enough to do anything about social media because I felt like people didn't even understand what social media was. Um, what we're seeing now is, is the speed with which that Congress is acting may also mean that they're willing to act specifically in response to a lot of harms that are associated with social media from the, that have been propagated and distributed by people like Jonathan Haidt and Gene, uh, Gene Tweedy. Not to mention, of course, the Attorney General lawsuits, the specific states' attempts to ban social media. But what I can tell you about all of this research is that this research doesn't really come to the same sorts of conclusions that the people who uh, Come to, who offer these simplistic narratives about the way that social media affects people's well-being. 
There's very little evidence that social media use is a direct cause of social of things like children's rise in suicide ideation, depression, or loneliness. There really is little evidence that there is a strong effect of social media abuse, either in a positive or negative you know, kind of direction. Um, there's also very good reasons to think that people use social media in a lot of ways that are very positive. You can think of the hedonistic pleasures associated with social media, learning and education, but also stuff like keeping in touch with friends and family, learning about things that you care about. So I think when we broaden the conversation about the kinds of things that we know about social media, I would start with the kind of assertion to say, we're going to see really a huge, I think, kind of misdirection between what are kind of the ways in which that social media companies and the kind of harms that are associated with that, those sorts of arguments. And then social scientists writ large in their ability to, to say, this is what's actually going on according to the research. And I think that those points of conflict are likely to continue to come up as we think about this in a regulatory regime. The second thing that I would add about this is you may not know that about only 6% of all of the existing research on social media and its effect on well-being is done from objective measures of social media use. Overwhelmingly, 94% is done on people's self-reported self-social media use, self-reports. And a lot of times self-reports and single item measures that say how many times do you use it per day or how much do you enjoy using it. These are not particularly good indicators of social media use. And in addition, we're drawing pretty enormous claims about whether or not we should ban, change, or use social media in different ways based upon particularly poor measurement. In that 6% of studies that have used social media uh, objective measures, a lot of them actually came from companies themselves. Facebook was actually released several articles during uh, the last two decades about social media use in collaboration with research. And they really, I think, turned off the tap on doing any kind of research that again. I've heard from people who work in social in uh, Facebook and Meta um, that they have done many other studies, but they're not releasing them anymore. And I think part of it, as a consequence of Cambridge Analytica and other concerns, is that simply they don't want to have that information available for people to be able to uh, create legislative litigation or otherwise, depending on what the findings of those studies would be. So there's an enormous black hole of information that we simply do not know from objectively measured social media use, how this affects users. Which brings me to my third point that I kind of want to start this conversation with is, if we, if the harms are not there, if the conversation, if the quality of the data isn't there, then what would be a potential way forward? So there are three models that I have seen used as research has matured and improved on social media use that I think that we can think about how this might think specifically about users' access to data. Uh, the first is, is that data donations. So some European scholars, particularly in Amsterdam and in Germany, have started to use data donations as a way to study social media use. Uh, having talked and spoken to those researchers, that is extremely hard to grapple with those data. They're very hard to translate into meaningful uh, measures that we researchers might actually like to use. So data donation, donations might be a way in which to kind of marry the ideas of having access to your own data but don't necessarily solve the bigger problems of how do we study whether or not social media has a positive, negative, or neutral effect on users' well-being. The second way that I've seen this approach is actually through APIs. Um, I was uh, honored to actually be part of a, a broader study that looked at uh, Twitter APIs in relation to who people follow leading up to the 2020 presidential election over a six-month period of time. And in that study, what was very fascinating is we could look at the networks of who were people following who and the, to test ideas around basically whether or not people became only interested in information that confirmed their viewpoints or only interested in information that challenged their viewpoints as the presidential election came closer and closer. Well, you may know, of course, Twitter's changed hands. Uh, the development of X, APIs have been shut down. The way that people, have users and, and uh, both researchers have access to APIs are totally at the discretion of companies, you know, that kind of uh, model that Lisa and I have talked about where companies get to choose whether or not they allow individuals, researchers or individuals to have access to API data is always going to, if, if it's not legislative or it's not uh, required to be available, uh, researchers simply won't be able to count on it to do longitudinal studies or long-term studies of social media use and, then, and their effects. The third model, which is one that I've used in my own research, is using some sort of tracking devices on uh, either Android or Apple phones. Um, Android devices now have a new program that's called um, Ethica. Uh, Ethica in Europe has been used to actually get objective measures of use in various ways, including things like the amount of time people spend, which programs they spend time on, um, and also some measures of content in that time. 
Uh, Apple screen time measure has also been used in the United States because Apple tends to be a more dominant platform or mobile device in the United States. Screen time measures are not as precise. Uh, they don't allow for kind of the sorts of things that some researchers might be interested in. However, they offer us a little window to better measuring social media use in relation to these things. So the kind of concluding points that I'd like just to sort of uh, draw your attention to, perhaps if you're outside the social science research uh, field and, and, and not aware of where kind of things are at, I would really say that we need much better data. We need much, much better data, objective data, high quality data, longitudinal data, data that is, allows for us publicly to have a better understanding if the purported harms of social media are as widespread and negative as they are, we need to have data to back those kinds of things up. We shouldn't be making massive policy decisions without having good quality data to base those upon. And the last thing that I mentioned on this is, let's not forget the possibility that social media are for all kinds of positive things as well. Um, if we look at the number of users of things like Facebook Messenger, uh, if we look at the number of people who use Instagram Messenger or WhatsApp or Snapchat for the purpose of messaging small groups of people, the rates of use probably far outpace the public use of social media. What I mean by that is if you take all of social media use for an individual, more of it are things they do in private than things they do in public. What does this mean? Just looking on what's on you know, X or what's on Facebook actually misses a great deal of information about how individuals might be both benefited and harmed by use. So for example, in the kind of things that I study, the messages we share in private with people who we love and care about make a big difference in our ability to combat loneliness, feel connected to our family, and to maintain relationships. So we can't forget the idea that social media is much bigger than just what we can see. It has a lot of things that happen behind the scenes, and having access to your own data actually might give us a more surprising story and also certainly a more informed story about its effects on the users themselves. Thanks, Jeff. And just to kind of stick to the theme of the interrogating social media um, uh, initially, I'll just, I'm going to skip to Swati since she's also uh, researching social media companies um, and, and ask sort of the same question about research. Um, yeah, thank you, Lisa. So I come at social science from a different perspective than Jeff, so it's really helpful to get multiple ideas of what is research. Um, so um, I'm a, what I would call a macro systemic level researcher, which means I don't study micro foundations, I don't study individuals and effects on, you know, loneliness or happiness, well-being. I think that's uh, a really helpful way to categorize data, but I look at um, uh, sort of large scale politics and macro histories. Um, and so for that kind of analysis, um, you, you don't need individual level data to be highly specified. Uh, you need to understand um, what is this a case of? You know, what are, what are platforms? Why should we have access to them in the first place? And so I come from the perspective of global governance where, you know, asking whether or not platforms are good or bad is like asking whether or not governments are good or bad. Um, and the answer is, of course, are both. Um, and uh, social media is not an option anymore. And it's a fact that you, you cannot exit uh, the use of um, uh, these technologies is what makes them, uh, I think, important for study, just, just like you cannot exit you know, governments anymore. And so the, the scale of platforms in terms of how large they are, how integrated they are in sort of not just um, personal lives, but in governance, in like political relationships, um, that's, that's, I think, what uh, demands greater access and greater transparency. Um, governments are also not obligated to let researchers walk in and study them, right? Um, there are certain kind of uh, types of data that they are supposed to publicize. Not all governments do that equally. And so as a political scientist, uh, the idea of lacking high quality data to study things of importance is not new. Um, you get stonewalled all the time. Archives are poorly kept. People lie to you in interviews, they destroy records. Um, and so in, in some ways, the idea of data quality is a perennial research question. Uh, what makes, I think, the platforms especially important is that they are also data companies, right? Like the way that they became big is because of collecting and harvesting data. And I think it's that hypocrisy of you have data and on everybody else and you are able to actually get capital because of that you're able to monetize that and uh, the asymmetry that but you know us as researchers who are trying to figure out 
whether or not that data is used in a way that could either exonerate them or it could be problematic, uh, we are able to jump through all these hoops to get access to a sliver of the data that they just go and grab, right? Um, and so I think that's what's kind of unique from my perspective is first that the companies are too big and too important to be left alone um, and uh, that they are not just uh, selling a service, but they are really uh, governors of our lives. And from that sort of macro political perspective, uh, just as if I would want to push for access of the US government and want to figure out what they are doing in the world, uh, I also want access to what Facebook and Google, uh, what, what they're doing in the world. And secondly, it's especially unique because of their data um, um, was key to how they became powerful and will, con will continue to be powerful. And so in my case, I think what's uh, important is, I, it's actually the user data stuff too, but actually I want access to the governance and the processes behind the companies. Uh, I want to figure out you know, who is making what decision when. I want to be on the Slack channels. I want access to memos. I want access to uh, who is in which team, uh, which team is reporting to whom. Um, and it's that kind of internal company dynamics, I think, that's actually really important. Um, so I think Jeff is talking about uh, expanding data quality of what's actually happening on the platforms. And I think that's really important for sort of micro foundational work. But for a macro historical uh, political uh, study, I want access to uh, the actual people and their processes and their policy changes. Um, and you'll notice that oftentimes, you know, when we have um, sort of leaks and document leaks from like whistleblowers or others, it's those documents that really interest me. It's, it's, it's the memos and who was ignored and who was actually yelling and were not heard. And those are the kinds of things that when, you, when we study governments, those are the things that brings governments down as well. It's those behind the scenes of policy making not the policies themselves per se. Um, and so uh, there's no provision in any of these models that Lisa was talking about that actually gives us access to literally go and observe the companies, right? Or have them provide some ways of uh, figuring out, not just uh, auditing the empirical aspects, but the governance aspects. Um, and so for my research, I think data is really important uh, because the companies are important and they hold these things valuable. So I think there's something to be gained from trying to get access to it. But I would like broaden the conversation in terms of both why we need it. I think, I think because there's too important to be left alone and the kinds of data that we need, which to me includes not just sort of user personal or non-personal data, um, but also data on the company themselves and how they operate and how they operate through contractors around the world, right? Like some are not, you know, uh, Meta might allow me access to some of their stakeholders, but they won't tell me about the content moderation contractors in Cambodia or Kenya who are actually doing a lot of the implementation. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that you only know because you've studied other powerful actors before and you know how governments stonewall you or how they move things outside or how they contract things. All of, this, all of these things that the US has done for a very long time uh, to avoid being studied. Um, but researchers are pretty good at figuring out some of these tactics. So I think we should apply some of that to companies now as well. Thank you, that's so interesting. And um, uh, to round out the conversation, I want to go to, to Gabe, you have the different perspective, come at these issues from a different perspective, and also have been involved in some interesting research looking at analogies to other sectors, um, like clinical trial data and whatnot. Um, so I would, I'd love to hear your perspective on like the purposes of social media um, research and access to data, what's at stake um, in this? Uh, yeah, totally. So I think Jeff and Swati have done a great job of talking about they are the researchers who use the data, who need the access to data. Uh, I think though in general, it can sort of be put into two camps of how it gets used, into addressing unknown unknowns and addressing known unknowns. Right, so research access to data has allowed us to uncover new concepts like information filter bubbles. It's allowed us to uncover these uh, CSAM distribution networks, all sorts of things that we couldn't know exist without researchers having access to data. And at the same time, it can also be used to validate beliefs and claims about how platforms operate, right? So uh, as Jeff was mentioning, you know, to what extent does uh, social media harm children's mental health? This popular belief that it does, 
their social science evidence that it doesn't. It allows us to address some of these claims, as well as some of the claims that companies make. So for example, um, in 2018, YouTube introduced something to their recommender system where they were saying, hey, we've heard about people rabbit holing, becoming sort of extremists from these recommendations. We've introduced a change to our algorithm to prevent that from occurring. And computational social science researchers could go in and say they did that. The rabbit holing is not happening as bad as it once was. We can compare between these two times. So it, it is useful both as sort of a corporate oversight mechanism and just empirically grounding some of our conversations. Um, I do want to get to your question of why is legislation important? And I think it comes down to the problem is that corporate data altruism is fickle. It is something that one cannot really depend on. And I think right now we see this sort of pendulum swing that is constantly occurring between researcher access to data and not researcher access to data. Um, and there is something here that is similar to the example of clinical trials, right? Where clinical trials, companies, you know, gave some access to their data, but basically no access to their data until uh, there was the crisis with thalidomide in the 1960s, which ended up, I think, like affecting thousands of babies. It was an anti-depression drug that was taken by pregnant women. And it led to, in the US, a, uh, the, a bill getting passed that basically required um, pharmaceutical companies to, among other things, share information about their clinical trials with the public for people to be able to observe those clinical trials and you know, critique the methodology, see where there might be gaps, et cetera. To make a long story short, there were basically various medical crises over the years where a drug would get introduced, it would cause a lot of harm, people would throw up their hands and say, what are we doing? and the law would sort of get strengthened kind of each time until today when we actually, it took decades of going back and forth between pharmaceutical company resistance and public outcry and lawmakers addressing that public outcry to get to the point where we are today where we actually do have pretty decent clinical trial data, right? Companies will publish a lot of things about their stage four, stage five clinical trials. People can look at that information People have found issues. It was very big during COVID. It helped a lot improve COVID research. Um, and I think there is an analogy of, at least with that pendulum swing, there is an analogy of what is happening with social media right now. So um, during the, after the 2016 election, there was a lot of blame that people had. They said, this is something that was caused by social media. There was all this misinformation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so Facebook released this Social Science One project, which many of you maybe have heard of, which was essentially designed to give researchers access to a lot of information about people's posts, who had viewed them, who, act, who had access to them, how widely they were spread, how widely they were seen. The project was riddled with issues about privacy, about Facebook doing too much to prevent the privacy, which then tainted the data. but. Needless to say, there was a high demand for researcher access to data to understand what happened, and there was public outcry. Then, uh, as Lisa mentioned, two years later, there was, um, there was Cambridge Analytica, right? And Cambridge Analytica had been using the APIs, the Facebook API, that researchers had been using to do research on how people were using Facebook. At that point, every social media company drastically reduced the amount of data that was available on their API, right? It was a very public crisis. Companies said, here's our response. We're going to uh, increase the privacy and security of our APIs that researchers are using. Great. A couple of years later, there was the NYU Ad Observer, right? NYU Ad Observer, they were looking at political ads on Facebook to see how um, to see whatever how they were being distributed, how micro targeting was being done, all sorts of very exciting research was happening. They used a mix of data donation and the Facebook API, and Facebook uh, 
shut this down. They said, hey, you know, this is this is unauthorized privacy access. There is this Federal Trade Commission consent decree that we have. We can't follow it. The FTC said, ha ha ha, you totally can't follow it. This is a bad use of our consent decree. Anyway, so right, we see this back and forth. Researchers demand data, researchers, uh, and then we want to get shut down. The researchers demand data, then we want to get shut down. I think though there is a problem that unlike in the case of clinical trials, where at least over decades, it seems to have improved the state of how much data researchers are getting, I think we are experiencing almost the opposite of right now. Where currently, we actually are in another crisis of researcher access to data. So much of that 6% of social science research that is happening, that is qualitative or, or based in generally distributed public information, was happening on, the vast majority of it was happening on Twitter using the Twitter API. There was also some of it happening on Reddit with their API and on CrowdTangle, which was used to observe what was happening on Meta's platforms. Uh, Twitter has, now X, has made their academic API $4,200 a month in a, in a fun joke for Musk, but a very unfun joke for researchers. Basically, none of them can afford that. Reddit has drastically reduced access to its API in order to shut down, in order to basically be able to hold that information to sell the generative AI companies themselves. And Meta has killed CrowdTangle in favor of their Meta content library, which many researchers are very upset about. And I think so we are in a place where like there is a researcher access to data crisis, but it is not getting, you, you know, when, when NYU Ad Observer happened, that's when PADA got proposed. That's when the Data Act got proposed. That's when DeSosa got proposed. You know, the government went up in arms and people got very excited in proposing bills. That's not happening right now because the crisis is not so acute. It's something that's happening very slowly and that's what makes it particularly scary. Thanks, Steve. So uh, uh, your examples are really uh, arresting and in some of them, right, there's this privacy story going on. Privacy is uh, often seen as one of the, the big risks involved in opening uh, uh, researcher access in different sorts of ways. So I want to like shift from thinking about sort of the opportunities and what we need to do to get better social media research and think about the risks involved and and or how we support researchers in navigating those risks. Um, and and I'm going to put you back on the hot seat, Gabe, since you, you sort, of, sort of raised this uh, issue in, in, in your comments to press you a bit more to talk more about um, what you think some of those risks are, because I know you think there are additional ones that, that you didn't mention in, in your specific examples as well. And then um, us, Jeff and Swati, just as researchers, just uh, give us a sense of how you think about like the risks you're at um, in, in getting access to data and how institutionally those risks get managed and what better support could be provided. Yeah, so I think a very popular one that people think about, two big ones that people think about are privacy and trade secrecy. Uh, and in this paper I wrote with Chris Morton and Salome Villoun, where we compare social media data access to clinical trial data access, we essentially say clinical trial companies face the same thing. Pharmaceutical companies argue that they would be sharing too much patient data and that their trade secrets would be, you know, other pharmaceutical companies would eat their lunch. And it was found out that basically these concerns were navigable. You could do de-identification, you have data clean rooms, right? All the time we're working on issues around how do we share information in a user privacy sensitive way. And I think that is something that is very important to think about when we talk about researcher access to data, how much information that users might not want or might not expect can get out there. And again, this is part of that pendulum, right? We don't want there to be a researcher access to data mechanism that gets introduced. It turns out it introduces all sorts of privacy problems and then we shut it down and the fire hose to data turns off forever, right? Like we want those privacy, cybersecurity, uh, trade secrecy a little bit more debatable, questions addressed. I think that there's two other things that people maybe don't talk about as much. Number one, when you gather any amount of data in a centralized place, there you have a concern that you're creating a honeypot for law enforcement. So any researcher access to data mechanism you need to do 
you need to think about to what extent can law enforcement get access to this, what protections are there, what might law enforcement learn about that. It's just general surveillance concerns. The other thing is that there could also be politically motivated access. I think the Platform Accountability and Transparency Act, or PADA, has kind of a great example of this. PADA works in basically three parts. One is that journalists and independent researchers should be able to scrape websites with user's permission, right? Essentially data donation. The second one is that researchers should be able to apply to get data from uh, platforms in a way that gets approved by the NSF and the Federal Trade Commission. They can go back and forth, but whatever. Basically, create a pipeline through the government through which researchers can access data. And then there's this third part of the act that essentially says companies, like the FTC can require companies to reveal information about, it, it gets kind of, they don't say, you know, who's been shadow banned and who has reach and whose reach has been disproportionately hampered and why, right? So. It goes to actually a lot of the mechanisms Lata, that you were talking about of like wanting to know like how are companies doing things and what are their internal governance decisions like but it was also phrased in a way that seems to be able to allow the ftc essentially to go on a politically motivated witch hunt to be able to say we've caught these companies for having um you know some sort of political bias in the data that they make available and again, researchers, there can be a lot of bad faith research. There are questions about to what extent do you want to kill good faith research and protect me against bad faith research. But people will use data, they will chop and screw it in a lot of different ways in order to make their points. And it does have to be something that is considered, right? It is not, researchers are not necessarily all people who, you know, we, we trust to do good faith research. There are some people who are politically motivated in the research and creating opportunities for that research to be done to to get excitement about certain political causes i think that is a real risk that often doesn't get to talk about but is important to address thanks Gabe. since you landed on uh, politics i'm going to uh, go to, to swati and ask the same question about um risks of access or um ways in which to support researchers in navigating the risks of access yeah, so I think I would uh, agree with all of that. I think bad faith research or bad actors right, exploiting access um, is definitely part of this. We already see, you know, in India, which is the largest market for Facebook, um, you know, the elections going on right now, and there's been a lot of issues about, you know, whether or not the like, whether or not the Modi government can just go ask for data and, you know, ask for they they've weaponized it before going after activists and journalists. So that sort of already happens. Um, so the, I guess one question is, um, what could this empower people to do it in a more legitimate way and not just sort of an obvious, uh, you know, like rights violating way? And I think that's that could happen. Um, I guess I'll talk about two things, which is um, so the DSA, you know, has uh, these provisions in Article 40 about different types of public and non-public access for researchers. Um, for, but we don't actually yet have the delegated act that tells us how you would actually do this. So there was a draft last year that came out, they had a comment period, uh, and they told us that sometime in spring, which is still going on, um, they will actually release the final delegated act and telling us the process of this. Um, and so things are like, nobody actually has access from that. Like it's been, you know, it's an effect, it's implemented, and then we get the transparency reports. Um, the, there's a DSA transparency center, so they're, they're doing some stuff, but the actual vetted researcher access has not been uh, nailed down. And one question is, um, they're considering, you know, having um, researchers send in proposals, which, which will be vetted by either the actual uh, d d the DSCs, the, the digital service coordinators, um, which would generally be in Ireland for most of the platforms, or it would be an intermediate body that might help between the um, DSCs and the platforms um, and the um, and the researchers. So that could be something like a social science one model, where you have you know a body of uh, researchers who vet proposals and then make recommendations to the governments. 
Um, and that could work well, but we don't know if that's the, what will be the final thing. But in these like uh, sort of vetting of proposals, and this is for uh, non-public uh, data, um, but like personal data, uh, you have to write up a lot in this proposal to even have access to the data. So you have to be very clear about your research question. You have to be very clear about what kind of data you want. You have to be clear about it's a hypothesis, like testing research program. Um, and I think all that works for certain kinds of social science research that is deductive, that you can try to guess what data you have access to. Um, and that might be vetted by people who are similarly uh, situated. But it doesn't work for like inductive, interpretive research or research that's not based on the EU, right? So that's the, that's the main limitation of the DSA. Like you have to say that it's something about systemic risk for the EU. Um, but the EU is now less than 10% of Facebook users. Uh, so how, you know, so we are getting access to something about systemic harm. We, we definitely are. But what I find interesting is that a lot of these platforms now are basically global south companies because that's where the billions of users are. They're not in EU and North America. Um, and that's also where we see the greatest harm for bad faith action, right? Um, and so I don't know how you kind of square that circle of um, you want, you know, research access, you want everybody to um, trust that researchers are doing it for the right reasons. Um, but first of all, you might not be able to specify in a proposal to this greater degree of what you want and why and what you will test, because actually a lot of times for inductive research, it's based on the data. And you don't know what to ask for. And that's the main issue with FOIA requests, is that you need to know exactly what to ask for. And by the time you figure that out, well, that itself takes a long time, right? And so this is a stalling process for, again, things we've learned from governments who don't want to be studied. And we're going to see the same thing applied to platforms. So I'm very curious when the Delegated Act finally comes out in spring uh, or summer and how they kind of manage that. Uh, but th this is the best shot we have, because they have figured out a process uh, and I'm, I'm optimistic that something will happen, but I'm still worried about the kind of research that will still be vetted um, and what what people are allowed to ask for and what this means in the grants, you know, in, in, in the kind of global scheme. So that's kind of the first risk that I think is just about how we study the platforms. And then the second one is um, so sometimes I think we, we tie harms to what's observable, right? And so it's like if we can if we can measure it, it's there, it's real. Um, but one thing that I'm interested in are things that might be observable at the individual level are not always what plagues us at a societal level. And this is the problem between micro and macro research is you might have a bunch of, you know, people that are healthy and happy and yet they are creating homelessness, right? So how does that work? We have a lot of structural injustice in the world when nobody intends to do harm. Uh, nobody wants to claim responsibility for that harm, you know, um, and yet we have unjust outcomes. And how we sort of figure that out, I think, is very difficult. And I think some social media were in that uh, ecosystem. So there have been a lot of studies from the NYU uh, Media Lab, right, uh, which, with, with Josh Tucker and all. In the last two years, they published stuff in Nature and Science about the 2020 election where they had this, you know, platform um, uh, contract to study it for three months, you know, basically a tremendous amount of data on basically voters, like real world data. And they found, you know, that the, you know, the whole like filter bubble thing, again, like puncturing that myth, they said, you know, there's not as much affective polarization as we thought, uh, all these other interventions about misinformation, you know, like things that we know about. And that's, I think, really helpful. But you're looking at three month period in 2020 and Facebook has been around, you know, for 16 years prior to that. So how do you account for the sort of accumulated effect of being on algorithmically mediated systems for 16 years before the study even starts? And so I think on the one hand, it's a very well done and thorough study and we have access to uh, things that we can say about the election. Uh, but on the other hand, um, as a society, we've been on the systems for so long, but it's actually very difficult to say, well, there's no independent effect of being on Facebook or being on Twitter on our public or political discourse. Um, because when, you, when you're starting the study at time one, things have already happened. Um, and so that's what I mean by it's difficult, I think, to tease out the individual and societal level of connections. Um, and that's, you know, no amount of research or access to individual level data will sort of give us that. 
Um, but those are my two things. One is the DSC implementation um, and how, what that tells us about the rest of the world. And then second is the, this micro-macro bridging. Thanks, Ray. That's fascinating. And uh, Jeff, uh, your perspectives on sort of what the risks are or how to help researchers manage this. It's very interesting because I, I guess there's two things that I would just draw and, and both of which from what Swati said that I think are, are worth kind of highlighting here. First is, is when you are a researcher at the levels that I like to be interested in, there is an IRB regime, right? There's institutional review board and the consent and the ethical consent given by individuals who are part of that research study are actually ones that have to go through a review system. It has to be supported by the university. There's the identification. And when data claims are made, they're claimed from the preponderance of the evidence, not from individual units of analysis, right? So these are you know, correlations or differences that are created through analysis, not necessarily, uh, I think some of the things you're talking about, like a honeypot of information that would be collected from hundreds of thousands of people. These are studies of 200, 300, 400 people over you know, some period of time. So I think one thing to think about is that when we talk about issues of privacy, data access, and things like uh, you know ethics, a lot of those are actually going to be covered within sort of research regimes, which are largely governed by the institutional review boards at specific institutions and universities. So some, in some ways, the, our, our faith in whether or not this is good faith or bad faith actors really gets placed in institutions themselves in answering those questions. But the, but the other thing that I, I think that what Swati said that I would really like to kind of highlight here is um, you know, dystopian and utopian narratives about the effect of technology will always be with us. They are not going anywhere. You know, we knew, were absolutely convinced that comic books were ruining children back in the 1940s, or television programs uh, were harming children in the 80s, or that video games were causing violence in the 1990s. This will continue. The question is, is that I think probably there is no study, or even set of studies, that will ever answer the question broadly are, huge societal trends like the rise of loneliness that we're currently seeing or the you know, issues around political sort of um, uh, animus towards one another are part of what's happening through social media as a causal factor or is reflected by social media because it's reflecting society as society changes. I think there are never going to be a satisfying answer. So I think one of the things that's very difficult about this is that SWAT is correct. No amount of individual level analysis, no matter how sophisticated, and I have a lot of respect for the NYU research study that she mentioned, can answer the questions because these questions would require a godlike researcher who would be able to know that these things are happening, follow them for 20 years, and precisely locate causal effects over time. So I would kind of just point out that I think that in, in a sense, we desperately need these types of data analyses, but they're never going to be really satisfying to any of these broader level societal concerns about from where do these you know, issues come from? How did we get to the place where our democracy was at in peril? And what role has social media played in that? Because the answer is it's both. It's playing very little role and it's playing a huge role at the same time. And I think that there's no way to absolutely know how. Um, so I think that broadly speaking, going back to the data issues, it always comes back to the level of analysis that you really want to know. The more public, the more accessible, and the more sort of widespread those data are, you're going to answer a very, very different kind of question than you're going to answer private, individual, affective, emotional, situational research, which is always embedded in people's lived experiences and their relationships with one another. So if your questions are at one level, you're going to answer different things than they're after another level, which makes this even more complicated. Thanks. Well, you guys have uh, opened up this terrain of sort of opportunities and risks um, in uh, a wonderful, rich way. Um, I have so many uh, additional questions, but I want to open it up to um, both the floor and online. We have a, a microphone that Nick um, will, will bring around um, if there are any questions in the room um, that you want to pose. Uh, hi, uh, Adrian Gropper, Patient Privacy Rights. Uh, you mentioned uh, something uh, like uh, uh, screen time and the other one. Uh, we have the unusual experience in the pandemic of introducing uh, 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 exposure notification mm -hmm. on a global scale. Mm -hmm. not, not that everybody adopted it, but it was something that was done in, in many cultures around the world. And my question uh, is, uh, do we have the right balance of data access 
outside of what's regulated at the corporate level, outside of what looks like clinical trials research in medicine, uh, are we being overly reliant on that centralized model uh, and the APIs that these people expose based on regulation and too little is being done on the client side, uh, privacy preserving in the sense that exposure notification was deemed privacy preserving with, but, but so sort of taking that completely other fork in achieving uh, what we're talking about. Uh, if, I, if I understand your question correctly, I, I think they, I, funny enough from where I sit, we have more on the micro level than the macro level. And the reason has to do with the fact that people can't get access to the data that they have from using their mobile or their social media devices and use that at a high, on a scalable effect to share that with some other institution who gathers national population survey data. So let me give you an example. There's an outstanding study that looked at whether or not happiness uh, measured by Gallup, the organization you know, who does really sophisticated polling throughout the world, in 100 and, you know, 120 countries or something like that. Uh, and then they looked at this in Facebook adoption rates. So Facebook themselves provided rates of change of adoption rates for different age groups over the course from 2004 to 2020 and looked at change in happiness in Gallup. At that macro level, that's really, really excellent analysis to say, as Facebook has been adopted, does it change the happiness of an individual country? But then you have the micro level, which is, does my happiness change based on my Facebook or any other social media use. From my perspective, there is a ton more studies at the my level than there are at the high level. And that, that has to do with the fact that corporations give or choose to not give that information at their, at their, you know, their prerogative. So in that particular study that I mentioned, Facebook had to cooperate with that researcher to provide those analyses. So I may, I, you may be asking a different question than the one I'm answering. I'm open to the possibility I got it wrong. But I would say, oddly, in, in what I look at, there's a lot more of the micro and not enough of the macro. Yeah, um, Adrian, if, if, I'm, if I'm getting a correct, your question correct, basically, like, like with uh, exposure notifications, can individuals be empowered to be the ones sharing data rather than it coming from the top down? Right. I think, because, I think to some extent, interventions and the design of the platform is sort of inescapable, right? So like three main ways that researchers will get access to direct user data are APIs, are data portability, and data donations usually through scraping. APIs are obviously, as you said, a very top-down design things. Companies decide what data is made available. Um, they decide rate limits. They can kill access to your API token, all sorts of things that they can do to control your access. It's not to fetter your access. Data portability of being able to download all of your data is another way that in theory works. But again, it really matters the ways that companies have designed their data portability regime. A lot of the times of that information, first of all, when you download your data, you are only getting your data. Right. If you're downloading your conversations with someone, you only get your side of the conversation. You don't get any other information. So on social media in particular, it can be very limited. But also a lot of platforms make that data available in a way where it's all a jumbled mess. So there might be really private things that you don't want to share with researchers and non private things that you, you, you do want to share with researchers. Some companies are better than others at making different data available but it's a challenge. And then not even to mention, like, you got to go into settings, you got to download a thing. They say, hey, it takes 24 hours for us to prepare this archive of data, and then we'll send it to you in 13 zip files, right? Like data portability is ugly. And the EU, like data portability should be allowed to send data directly to another platform has never actually happened, like barely exists data transfer project aside, that's a tangent. The last mechanism of scraping, right? You allow a researcher, you essentially download an extension, you allow a researcher to collect data from that extension. In theory, the researcher could take a lot more data, but you know, in the example of NYU Ad Observer, 
They had Mozilla do, I think, independent privacy analysis and independent cybersecurity analysis. Like there are ways to, and the code was open source, right? Like you can do that in an accountable way, but even then you will be coming up against the company's anti-scraping mechanisms, which are always updating and always changing. And, uh, you know, web scraping is just like a weird gray legal area. So it's like, you might be opening up yourself to litigation. So even that most independent possible one, it is such a technical pain and not even to mention the selection bias of the folks who are more likely to access these apps um, are, are the one, you know, whatever, have their own certain selection. So it, it is, I think basically total independence is, it's kind of impossible and that sucks. Swati did you look like you good? But are there other questions in here? Okay, so I guess we have one. Um, so I had a question that is more on social media research than data access, and that follows some of the things that I've heard in this panel. Um, and I'm really pu interested and puzzled about, um, which is um, this. So the, the kind of the relationship between the micro and the macro particularly interests me. And there's a sense in which I think the scientific method so far, right, that we possess today tells us that we need to look for cause and effect. And I think the digital economy is challenging that method and there is a way in which we see tangible effects at a macro level. We are seeing, say, the emergence of far-right governments all around the world. That seems to be pretty tangible evidence that something is going on. And perhaps the information ecosystem has a role in that. Whether or not one can pinpoint causes or exact causal connections is a different question and so i'm wondering you know i predict so talking about TikTok and like addictive social media and stuff like that um i think medical practitioners the surgeon general have been um making statements about adopting a precautionary approach um and kind of taking you know a risk-based approach so even if we can't establish perfect cause and effect links, it might be worth regulating, it might be worth intervening, it might be worth, worth putting certain systems or safeguards in place. And I wonder how that kind of plays into these discussions about data access. Yeah, I think that's central. Um, it also depends on which model of responsibility you're working with. So if you're working in legal liability models, or some of them, uh, then discrete cause and effect becomes important for certain types of liability right and so um, then you need to show very clearly um, what might have happened that led to this and that and certain decisions but there are other liability models that are broader than that like you don't have to show these discrete independent effects and this discussion came out you know last year in the net choice cases when um, people couldn't figure out, you know, how uh, Twitter and YouTube algorithms were enabling uh, ISIS propaganda, which then led to this, uh, these different terror attacks, right? And some of the connections that the Supreme Court were making were like, all right, if somebody's going to go do an on, on the ground terrorist attack and if they go eat at a Korean restaurant on the way and they were nourished and fed, you know, is the Korean restaurant now responsible because it's on the pathway to then enabling them to have enough energy to carry out the attack. They got into very nitty gritty details about what it means to play a role in something. Um, and I think some sort of legal plat legal models are not well equipped to deal with uh, more systemic uh, ways of looking at problems. Um, and so the EU uses the word of systemic risk, right? And But even that is, uh, it's defined, but how you make the connections between what becomes systemic and when, uh, that is still left open to interpretation. And I think that's good, that's a good way, because we don't want to just define systemic in one way. But it becomes, not only is it difficult to think about bridging the micro-macro in like clearly defined harms, 
but it becomes even more difficult when the harms themselves are open and left to things like systemic. Um, so I think if you're looking only at certain kinds of platform responsibility, which top-down regulation is doing, um, so like we have audit standards for the DSA, but, um, and so how do the auditors know that the companies are complying? Um, and the audit standards have been raised too high in some way, right? The DSA is uh, usually you start at a lower standard and you go up, but they're already at the high standard. So some people are complaining that auditors might not actually even take on DSA implementation because they're too worried about um, tracing some of these links. But if we're outside of that cause and control model where you have to show that the company knowingly or unknowingly contributed to this harm, if you're in a political model, or as users of the publics, you know, um, we might not need to know everything in the causal pathway and figure out, okay, this happened and this happened and this happened and the company knew about it here or it should have known about it here and it would still um, made a difference here. Um, then in a non-legal or made a more legally expansive way, I think we could start abandoning that we need to show very clear discrete links between company actions and systemic harms because you're not going to see that. And it means that as a public, we need to have arguments about um, our, our standard of culpability or standard of responsibility that we assign. And this is what I was talking about in terms of the ecosystem is you're not going to catch some of these effects over a three month period. And you're not going to often, you know, trace it back to specific algorithms and specific motivations behind that. Um, so things are going on in the world and the effects seem bad. Uh, some of them might be happening alongside, right, platform things. And then this is when we get into correlation and causation. And from my perspective, causation is hard, even in like very clear cases, you know, it's very difficult for us to make these claims. Uh, but in terms of platform responsibility, we don't need to go down that path. I think there are alternatives and thinking beyond, again, this individualist mode of discrete causal obligation. If we take a structural approach, which a systemic risk, almost you have to because the system is in the, is in the definition. Um, that I think we need to think about it more broadly, but then the companies would be like, well, how do we comply with that, right? How do we know that we're doing it right? Um, so the scientific method is definitely implicated in it, but I think so are the legal models for responsibility. Um, and the, the fact that we demand certain things to be very clear and discrete and causal pathways uh, for liability is in some ways um, creating burdens for both researchers and companies. Um, yeah, I, I want to make this point quickly, but there is something that, Electra, your question sort of brings up something that I will say keeps me up at night in terms of like researcher access to data, which is basically like, what if the transparency haters are right? There's a whole world of especially people in fact who argue that there is a wide gap between transparency and accountability mechanisms. Even if you can draw that causal link that social media has caused all of the ills of our modern world, like will that, will that turn into any kind of change? And there's two folks who I think about in particular, I think about Claire Bertal's work on where she basically talks about how a lot of the times when new transparency mechanisms get introduced, essentially what happens is the work of the government then gets um, gets offloaded onto civil society, right, and academics. Civil society and academics become these sort of watchdogs where the government wasn't, and those folks are farther from the means of power than the government is, right? So it's like maybe actually by creating more independent transparency, you've lessened the chances because you create expectations that everything will work out in the market of ideas, right? That companies' reputations will be the ones that lead them to change and that that work can happen without government insight. The other one I think about is David Posen, who's done uh, uh, a lot of work on government transparency mechanisms in particular, which reminds me of what Swati was talking about, sort of making a comparison between government transparency and social media transparency, where essentially there are you know, many sunshine laws and requests for comment and all of these things that were introduced in the 70s in order to create 
public participation and accountability in government have become mechanisms for companies for companies to throw sand in the gears of the way that that um, the government operates, right? In order to gain information that they can use in lawsuits against the government, right? Like it is, it was designed to create a corporate accountability, but by giving a means to put input in, it's actually just allowed outside folks to have different kinds of influence. Maybe this is going a little far afield, but I wonder if that kind of thing could happen with researcher access to data. Politically motivated actors looking for information that they can then use to reveal some kind of political bias, some kind of whatever, that then affects the ways that companies do things in order to say like, oh, we have to assume that all of our communication is going to be visible to the outside, that all of our internal mechanisms. And so like that may actually not even always lead to the most positive outcomes because people might use those, like might politicize or use that input that they have for their own political gain. I, I don't know if that's a real concern to be worried about, but I guess like the idea that like bring transparency and the rest will follow is very much a question. It's an assumption worth questioning and it's one that is worth always keeping in the back of our heads as we think about what does an ideal transparency mechanism look like and what do we want for researcher access to do that. Jeff, you? Yeah, I, I, would, I, I would only add two things I think that are haven't been said already. What, one is, is there's always have to consider the fact that we have unintended consequences of any sort of attempt to fix a problem. And at some level, you know, as uh, I think the Surgeon General report, like you mentioned before, you know, cutting people off, depending on the regulatory regime we want to say should happen, maybe no child under 16 should ever have any access to a mobile phone or otherwise. The Surgeon General reports also draw attention to the fact that a lot of adolescents find connection and companionship in places in where they feel discrimination, in places where they cannot find support in their own home. So the question is, is are we would be willing to sacrifice a handful of very important people who or people who very need social media in a very important way so as to benefit the whole? And those are those are kind of contradictions you're gonna face by any solution that I think that people want to come up with. So the unintended consequences of an intended a well-intended effect might be something we need to think about. But I think the better answer to go back to I think why Lisa organized this panel panel is we don't have good answers. So we can also say the scientific model is broken or it's not good enough or the causal effects are hard to pin down, which is what Swati said, and I agree with that. But frankly, we don't have good enough data because participants don't have access to the best quality data to even make the claims to begin with. We don't even know a really good answer to the question. So we can start with the saying there's definitely harms and take action, but that may have unintended consequences. Or we can say, we actually don't know, which is, I think, the state of literature, and we need better quality data to answer the question, which is where I think Lisa started all of this. Yeah, and uh, uh, just because I'm a lawyer, I'm going to jump in. If, uh, I, think, I think it's kind of interesting that, you know, some of the models, like the Canadian model is so narrow, but they're taking the view, but, well, we can intervene and regulate with respect to guardrails around some pretty specific harms, like, you know, child pornography, cyberbullying, non-consensual intimate images. Like, you know, these are pretty, I think ones that there's a, a pretty good consensus around, maybe not the necessarily consensus around what Canada's specific response is, but that these are harms worthy of intervention. Yes. Um, and then you have the access model that's really tethered to that kind of research on whether or not they're really, you know, implementing their digital safety plan in the right sort of way, which is a very, very, very narrow kind of uh, data access. Or you can take the view of broad data access that we see in other kind of models, which is more exploratory, potentially, but with all the limits that have been flagged here, um, which are serious, um, to just say, we just don't know. There's lots of things we don't know, and, and there's lots of potential regulatory interventions. There's, People who can be sued. There's like, you know, in, in my home province, they're banning cell phones in schools. And like, there's like lots of different kinds of levels of intervention that can happen that we hope are data driven, but aren't um, because we don't have the research. And so you have to start with the research with the hope that it's not going to just be some kind of transparency regime, but that you're actually going to end up with um, interventions. Um, and, and, and so I guess my worry is that in models like Canada's, you're not opening up that broader kind of research access to ask those other sorts of questions. 
um, in order to try to figure out whether we can actually have different types of interventions, you're keeping it so small that it's just not going to be very useful, um, which is why I prefer some of these other um, models like, like PADA. Um, if you had another question in the room, until then. So, thinking again about some of the some of these uh, these things and uh, uh, questions about transparency, I was thinking uh, in terms of uh, allowing access to data to be actually driven by, by firms who actually own this, uh, this data. We know from, uh, uh, from research, uh, we know from whistleblowers that Facebook actually did tamper with the data pool that they have allowed uh, researchers. Francis Hausman was very clear uh, about this. They, they said this pool that was allowed of data that was allowed for researchers was very much cleared by the company before discussed, decided that uh, nothing there is going to, going to be uh, problematic for a company and then given out uh, uh, to, to researchers. We also know anyone working uh, on uh, um, clinical trials knows that there is a lots of lots of problems uh, with self-selection clinical trials being, being really tempered, being very skewed in, in one way. So there is a whole team of researchers so in terms of the transparency, in terms of the, the allowing the, the data access, I think these are, these are really problematic uh, things. If a company is the one who is able to, to actually mm -hmm. allow the access and decide what sort of research we are going to have, we're going to end up in the same type of research uh, that, that happened with the cigarette companies allowing one type of research and not the other type of research. So who decides which data and how to do it? Thank you. Anyone want to respond to? Um, how do you ensure that even when you have data access, um, what, what kind of mechanisms can you put in place to say that you know the, the social media company or other type of platform company is actually you know giving you the data inventory um, in an accurate way that's going to let you understand what sorts of research is even possible, and they're going to be honest about it and not fall into these sort of self-serving um, uh, habits. I don't know if either of any of you. I might actually jump in and add a related question yeah, from sure. the online audience, um, but and you sort of touched on this in your opening remarks, Lisa, but what criteria should be used to establish the entitlement to access the information as well? Yeah, so the DSA has you know, under Article 43 channels. The first one is that national regulators or the European Commission has access to the data. Uh, the second one is that a researcher has access to non-public data. And this is the delegated act that is still coming out. And people are suggesting having an intermediate body like Social Science One or something. Um, and then the third one is vetted research access to public data directly from platforms. And so it's the third one that I think is most uh, implicated in your question because platforms claim under GDPR they have to be involved, right? They are the data controllers and so they, they, you have to sort of go to them. They can't be skipped out of that. Um, and, but the, the way, but so then you kind of go into the different regulatory regimes and this is the direct trade-off between privacy and access. Uh, they've, been, they've been claiming GDPR for a while to deny requests, um, but now I think there is at least a mechanism to say, look, you can't just use that. You need to be more sophisticated than that. Um, and so, but the, the, the second one, which is a vetted access to non-public data through either the government or an intermediate body, that's the question about what it, what it would take. And we don't, at least in the European context, we don't have an answer to that yet. But we do know, for example, um, there are questions about what it means to be affiliated with a research institution. Uh, whether or not, you know, like, for example, would like CDT count, we, you know, would we need uh, like the level of access? Because there are a lot of people who do research that are not just at academic institutions. Um, and so they've been, there's been a back and forth on what that means. And there's a commercial independence clause. So what does commercial independence mean? You know, a lot of us are paid by not just our universities, but we do consult oftentimes. Um, uh, so does it mean you're never allowed to take any industry money? Like, you know, Berkman is often funded by, you know, these companies and they provide us lunch. So what does that mean? You know, no, no more. But, you know, at one point there was a meta event in the fall where the lunch was provided. Right. And so I think you start getting into these questions about uh, the nitty gritty of how this will be implemented. Um, so who counts as a researcher? What's an affiliation? What's independence? Um, but 
I think you're absolutely right in terms of that this is the information asymmetry, right, that I'm talking about. It's like we don't even know the extent to which uh, we, we are entitled to certain kinds of data. And if the data is then tampered with, we wouldn't know if it's tampered with it unless you get these leaks that tell us. Um, you know, I think it's, a, it's interesting, uh, there's this whole debate about stolen documents. So one thing that is interesting for, you know, the kind of research that I do is uh, academic journals, we also need to have peer reviewed guidelines, right? So there's a coalition for independent tech research, which I'm part of, and the coalition is uh, doing a data audit, is asking researchers if they've had trouble getting access to uh, platform data. But one thing that we're also talking about is having standards for peer review, uh, because it's, one thing for you know um, Josh Tucker or like Gary King to go make these one-on-one -on -one deals with the platforms for access, um, but then the rest of us get left out of it. Um, but also when you make these deals, it makes it harder to argue for these public intermediary ways um, that anybody should be part of. And so how do we review that kind of research when it gets sent to our journals? Um, do we, do we require that, no, that, that nothing that has been signed an NDA should count as a public research? Um, that makes it very difficult to do these kinds of um, you know, um, uh, platform deals. But the other thing that I think is that how do we know you're right? How do we know this data is reliable? So you got access to this data, you tell us that you have really good quality data, but how do we know it's not tampered with? And so those are questions that as academics we need to take on because um, as data access becomes more transparent, uh, we need to question about reliability. Um, and then the other thing that I just sort of want to end with is, um, again, these are questions that we've dealt with before. So the, the thing about stolen records is, uh, so the, 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 the Hagen leaks, which are now you know, housed in Harvard uh, Shore Science Center, the, the Facebook files, uh, some journals will not allow you to publish using stolen documents, what they, what they claim are stolen documents. And so um, like WikiLeaks, for instance, you know, um, they said, look, these are all stolen archives. You're not allowed to use it. Uh, there's a whole risk management approach to journal publication too. And so they forbid researchers from using WikiLeaks documents and they forbid us from using Facebook files documents. And so you have to then have a conversation with the journals that look, this is how we are getting information. <laughs> Um, hard to study uh, companies and just like we um, you know all data is stolen in some way when governments are going and extracting information and putting it in their archives they're calling it uh, just like safekeeping but you know we can also call it stolen data um, so these are debates that we need to be having because um, since we are not able to always trust the validity of the data given to us we should be able to augment it using these other leaked documents, but oftentimes those leaked documents are not allowed to be used in peer reviewed research, which adds to the asymmetry between what's known about us and what we can say about the companies. Which is a great note to end our panel on because we're at time. Um, this was fantastic. I think you gave us lots to think about in terms of um, you know, the, the data access for accountability purposes is important, but there's so much more um, around uh, social media research. Uh, that we need to think about, uh, take the much more broader lens, and that there even data access isn't going to be the only thing that we should be thinking about, right? We talked about scraping and data portability, tracking devices, whistleblowers, um, you know, uh, various sorts of community practices, um, intermediaries, right? There's a whole host of, of issues there, and hopefully we'll continue the discussion um, after a break with the next panel that's focusing a lot on the implementation um, side of um, uh, this question. So please join me in thanking our first panel for a fabulous discussion. <laughs>